Tonight, the grief and searing anger of a Texas father whose daughter was killed at school. God knows how long my little girl or the rest of were, were like that. Plus, confirmation of how long it took police to charge in. Also tonight, after widespread public disgust, Canada soccer cancels its match against Iran. Canada soccer should have anticipated the blowback that would occur. And need a rental car for that vacation? You might want to get on it. We're expecting a pretty crazy summer. And why that is and what choices you may have. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Today was the last day of the school year at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. Children should have been plotting lazy days ahead, parents conspiring to keep them busy. Instead, many families are planning funerals. They and their neighbors still in shock after Tuesday's massacre, killing 19 young children and two teachers. But alongside the grief, angry questions about the police response as the gunman entered the school and why it took them so long to end things. Susan Ormiston is in Uvalde, Texas again tonight. Susan, we've heard from police today, but there are still many unanswered questions. Clearly, the investigation is centered on the shooter, why and how, but parents are now pressing to understand why he couldn't be stopped. 21 lives, a memorial changing and growing each day, a steady parade of mourners, as parents question whether police acted swiftly enough. They could have done something quicker. I mean, this could have been been over in a couple of minutes, if not, you know, not 45 minutes. Javier Casares lost his little girl, Jacqueline, nine years old, a real firecracker, he says. She can be feisty, you know, and uh, kind of comforts our hearts to think that She'd be the one, one of the ones that was brave and tried to help, you know, as much as she could. He's tormented, believing officers should have moved in faster to stop the shooter. God knows how long my little girl or the rest of were, were like that. On Tuesday, he was in the crowd of anguished parents outside begging police to push into the school and pleading to get closer themselves. This is one of those things, you know, just sort of fathers father's love, father's anger, you know, you want to get in there. As far as everything goes, I mean, yeah, I honestly think that it, it could have been, so a lot more could have been prevented, so prepared. They were taking gunfire. Today, Texas Rangers tried to clear up the timeline, admitting from when the shooter crashed his truck to when he entered the school, he met no resistance from armed police a full 12 minutes. He walked in unrestructed initially, so from the grandmother's house, to the bar ditch, to the school, into the school, he was not confronted by anybody. Two officers followed him in four minutes later, but they took fire, backed off, and called for help. Approximately an hour later, U.S. Border Patrol tactical teams arrive. They make entry, shoot and kill the suspect. An hour. By that time, students and teachers were dead. Should they have advanced sooner? That's a tough question. I don't have enough information to answer that question just yet. Casares is determined to get some answers. I promised my little girl on, on <laughs> well, I saw her at the hospital, and I promised her, you know, her, her, um, her death was not going to be, you know, in vain. I'm, I'm going mean, to do whatever I can. The Uvalde shooting is resonating throughout Texas. Maria Martinez and her daughter drove from Houston. This hits home. I lost my son due to gun violence, and I'm upset. I'm upset that this is happening. These kids had a whole life ahead of them, and I'm really, really upset that this kid got a hold of some guns. It's, it's out of control. We watch this and think it just keeps happening. Do you think this will make any difference? I mean, I hope so, but I doubt it. It is a sad commentary. So, Susan, this has already devastated families, and tonight we're hearing about another tragedy. Yeah, so difficult. One of the teachers who died, Irma Martinez, her husband Joe had delivered flowers at her memorial today, and when he got home, he suffered a massive heart attack and died. He was just 50, and they now leave behind four children. It's just another piece of the trauma that's gripping Uvalde this week and will take so much time to heal. 
MD. Susan Ormiston in Uvalde, Texas. Thank you. Now, here in Toronto, a man was shot dead by police today. They had received calls he was carrying a rifle near a school. There is no threat to the public, as this is believed to be an isolated incident. Investigators say they found a long barrel firearm at the scene. Several schools in the area went into lockdown. Ontario's police watchdog is investigating. Hockey Canada says it has settled a lawsuit involving sexual assault allegations against members of the 2017-2018 National Junior Team. In a statement, Hockey Canada said that as soon as it became aware of this matter in 2018, it contacted local police authorities to inform them. The person bringing the allegations forward chose not to speak and also chose not to identify the players involved. We have settled this matter and will not be commenting further. Now, Canada soccer has cancelled a contentious men's national team exhibition match with Iran. It was to have been part of the team's World Cup preparation. Ashley Burke now on what changed and who Canada could play instead. Oh, a mistake from the penalty spot. A controversial friendly suddenly called off after public anger, saying the game had become significantly divisive. Today, Canada soccer backtracked from hosting Iran's men's national team. We are happy that they corrected the bad decision that they made. At the center of the calls for action, families of victims who died on Ukraine Airlines Flight 752. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps shot down the plane, killing 176 people most on their way to Canada. Experts say that same branch of the military controls all sports clubs in Iran. It's important for us to cancel any kind of relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran. They have no place in this country when the, our loved ones are buried in cemeteries. Canada! Canada soccer said it had the best of intentions, that the match was a good one to prepare Team Canada for November's World Cup. Iran is 21st in the world soccer rankings. Canada is 38th. Iran has always struggled to book friendlies ahead of the World Cup. Um, and I think Canada soccer should have known this, and I think Canada soccer should have anticipated the blowback that would occur. The soccer organization says it's working to refund ticket holders for the almost sold out match and promised to review its protocols as Canada searches for a new opponent. Ukraine already raised its hand. It's ranked 24th and says the money would go towards its humanitarian needs for Ukrainians affected by Russia's invasion. We have not yet officially requested uh, Canada Soccer Association, but uh, they are our neighbors. They're not far from the embassy. I'm happy to walk there and ask them if they, if they are ready. The head of Iran's soccer team had said that Canada Soccer was going to pay its football federation $400,000 for this match. Today, Iran's deputy minister of sport announced he'll be seeking damages. $10 million, he says, for Canada soccer breaking its contract. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. One person is dead and several others were treated in hospital today after an ammonia leak at an ice-making facility in Kamloops, B.C. The facility is located in an industrial park north of the city. People in the area were forced to leave and some roads were closed as well. No word on what's caused the leak. Police are investigating. The Public Safety Minister tells CBC News that changes are coming to the RCMP that would restrict how officers can restrain suspects. This comes two years and a day after the death of George Floyd on a Minnesota sidewalk. David Thurton takes us through the new measures not yet announced and what other efforts there are to keep people safe. After two years of outrage over the death of George Floyd, the public safety minister tells CBC News Canada is responding. A promise to ban RCMP from using certain control techniques, tear gas, rubber bullets, and neck holds. We think that with a new and modernized um, set of policies around use of force by the RCMP, that it can serve as a role model uh, for other uh, law enforcement branches across the country. This former police officer applauds banning neck holds. It is very dangerous. People can be injured, people can be killed. The reason, it's a danger. That officers aren't trained to do this technique properly. Another former officer worries what alternatives are left. If firearms become the only option, then, uh, then you know, it's reasonable to think that uh, things might go very badly at times. 
One anti-police advocate says these and other measures should only be a start. Progress has been made, but there definitely is work to do. And it's, and it's the, the, the basically activists have to keep on pushing. Because One area where some are pushing Van One responding to dispatch is non-policing solutions. Already up and running in Toronto, an $11 million pilot project where health and crisis response professionals offer support to non-violent events the public calls in. With no armed and uniformed officers in sight, they offer support in mental health crises. If necessary, food, a bed for the night, and follow-up care. We know that this kind of service works in other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, if there are other models in the States and in, in Europe. That's the groundwork that has been laid. As the government says, change is coming to the RCMP. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Some families of the victims of the Nova Scotia mass shooting protested today outside the inquiry into the 2020 massacre. Been uh, wanting answers, we've been wanting truth, um, and we just haven't been getting it. They're upset about why some police officers aren't being forced to testify in person. Today, a retired senior Mountie said he was involved in the decision to delay a public warning that the gunman was driving a replica police car. He testified that doing so would have created havoc and prevented police from finding the vehicle. And today, a Calgary man was sentenced to 12 years in prison for crimes committed during his year-long stint as an ISIS fighter in Syria. Hussein Borhat pleaded guilty to two terrorism-related charges, one that involved kidnapping. In 2013, Borhat traveled to Syria and operated as a trained sniper. After his return, CBC News reported on leaked ISIS documents, which helped authorities track him down. Well, police in the Toronto region are struggling to get a handle on a spike in carjackings, on average a couple a week just this year alone. Stephen D'Souza shows us where police think all those cars are heading and their advice for drivers. The thieves are brazen, sometimes operating in broad daylight. And they can be extremely violent. The rash of carjackings has some drivers around Toronto on edge. I'm going to be scared because you never know, even if you're in a safe environment, anything can happen. There were six attempted carjackings across Greater Toronto last night alone. The victims were in their own driveways. Toronto police say there have been 98 carjackings so far this year. That's almost as many as took place in all of 2021. Police say two attempts last night were successful. A Toyota Corolla and Honda Civic were taken. Car security experts say they could have been stolen for use in other crimes. Typically, police say high-end cars are targeted, destined for overseas buyers. Immediately put in shipping containers and they are sent overseas. It's a very high profitable industry in the underworld with, with these types of property crimes. Toronto police are adding additional resources to crack down, but experts warn... This can't be a one-time Band-Aid fix, like put, putting a Band-Aid on a leaky dam. These crimes, unfortunately, will never go away. You can put them in the engine compartment. You can put Meanwhile, businesses anywhere. selling vehicle tracking systems are getting busier. In the last two weeks alone, our sales have uh, uh, gone up tremendously. He says built-in GPS systems can be easily overcome while newer trackers are smaller and harder for thieves to find and disable. So we have to evolve to make sure uh, that we can get the cars back for our customers, which, which we have. With cases rampant, police offer this advice. If somebody's approaching you to take your car and they're pointing a gun at you, give them the car. A message that in recent weeks has become all too common. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the number of confirmed monkeypox cases in the country is growing, with one confirmed case in Ontario and another 25 in Quebec. But as Julia Wong explains, federal public health officials say they have tools to track the virus and protect against it. There are now 26 confirmed cases of monkeypox in Canada, with dozens more suspected. Anyone could contract it, but today, federal health officials said there's no need to panic. The risk of infection is currently low for the general population. The smallpox vaccine can protect against monkeypox. And because Quebec has all but one of Canada's confirmed cases, it has received 1,000 doses from a strategic stockpile. The province is offering doses to close contacts of confirmed cases. The cases would 
really be careful with their contacts and and the contacts that would have to uh, uh, could could have uh, a benefit to be uh, vaccinated if they are taken uh, rapidly. After an exposure, you might have three, four days, maybe even longer, where a vaccination will actually be quite effective at protecting that individual. Monkeypox symptoms include fever, headache, and lesions. The World Health Organization says there are about 200 confirmed cases outside of the countries where it normally spreads. The majority of those new infections happen to involve men who have had sex with men. Monkeypox can spread through sexual contact, but also through contaminated objects or close contacts. And experts are clear, this is not like COVID-19. It's a very different beast. It's not, not something, you know, walking down the street, it's going to come wafting through the air. The federal government is preparing to send more doses of smallpox vaccine across the country. We are in active discussion uh, with, uh, with the authorities there. I think the key point to be made there is that uh, uh, we need to be sure that uh, the vaccine can arrive in sort of a short course should the need uh, or demand uh, occur in a specific province or Territory. The Public Health Agency of Canada says mass vaccinations are unlikely. And while it won't say how many doses it has due to national security concerns, it says it's working to make sure there's enough vaccine on hand. Julia Wong, CBC News, Ottawa. A fire in the neonatal ward of a hospital in Senegal has killed 11 children. Families gathered at the hospital to see if their child was among the victims. The truth for some devastating. Senegal's health minister told local media that an early investigation suggests the cause was faulty wiring. The Ukrainian military admits that in the war for the country's east, Russia now has the advantage. Margaret Evans shows us how tremendous firepower unleashed on the Donbass is pushing Ukrainian defenders to the brink. Donbass, eastern Ukraine. Nothing even like a slow burn as Russia picks up the pace of its offensive. These pictures show Russian forces using so-called vacuum bombs. They land with devastating effect and a huge footprint. Supply lines and escape routes to the few remaining towns and villages under Ukrainian control in the Luhansk region have come under heavy fire in recent days, now nearly cut off by the Russians. Ukrainian officials say their troops are outgunned and outnumbered, the deputy defense minister saying fighting is now at what she calls maximum intensity. The enemy attacks our positions at different points simultaneously, she's saying. We are in for a very difficult and long stage of the struggle. And an increasingly costly one. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says they're losing 50 to 100 soldiers every day. He balks at any suggestion Ukraine agree to surrender land to end a war it didn't start. His foreign minister has carried the same message to the World Economic Forum in Davos. There is nothing in between. It's either them or us. And everyone in the world has to make a choice where do they stand. The increased fighting in Donbass means yet another wave of Ukrainian civilians fleeing, most already traumatized by the relentless destruction being wrought all around them. And Ukrainian officials are now also pointing to a renewed threat from the north, saying Russia has moved Iskander missile systems to positions in western Belarus. And as Russia pushes its advance in the east, it's also working hard to establish facts on the ground in territory it's already taken in the south, putting plans in place to fast track Russian passports for residents of those now occupied areas. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Lviv. British prosecutors are bringing four charges of sexual assault against actor Kevin Spacey. The alleged incidents against three younger men took place between 2005 and 2013. The news came as Spacey was testifying in a New York courtroom in a civil lawsuit. Actor Anthony Rapp alleges Spacey assaulted him when Rapp was a teenager. An acclaimed American actor, Ray Liotta, remembered for his charismatic turn in the classic gangster film Goodfellas, has died. Best known as a Hollywood tough guy, Ray Liotta actually started out in soap operas as blue-collar heartthrob Joey Perini in Another World in the late 70s. And that's why we'll never hit it off, because I'm just a person. Well, what do you 
He later won acclaim as Shoeless Joe Jackson in Field of Dreams. You wouldn't believe how many guys wanted to play here. But it was Martin Scorsese's good fellas that made him a bona fide star. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. While he and Scorsese would never collaborate again, Leota went on to win further acclaim in gritty dramas like Copland, and for decades, he remained an in-demand character actor. Most recently, in the comedy drama Marriage Story, and the Sopranos prequel, The Many Saints of Newark. I'm listening. Stay out of his life. Ray Liotta was reportedly filming a new movie in the Dominican Republic when he died in his sleep. He was 67 years old. Well, if you're looking to rent a car this summer, you may be out of luck. But now it's like your friends. Coming up, rental companies can't keep up with demand, but new businesses are popping up to fill the gap. It's also important uh, to protect the English-speaking minorities in Quebec. The Prime Minister criticizing Quebec's latest French language law, but can Ottawa stop it? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel are here. But first, demand for action in Nova Scotia after thousands of fish died trying to pass a hydro dam. It was unbelievable, really. We're back in two. Residents along the Gatineau River are bracing for flooding. Hydro-Quebec is releasing more water from its upstream reservoir, which is at capacity due to spring runoff and heavy rains. The river's water level is expected to peak Saturday. The carcass of a mink whale was spotted this morning floating in the St. Lawrence River, about 45 minutes north of Montreal. Experts say it's likely one of the two whales spotted just weeks ago. The animals were hundreds of kilometers upstream of their usual habitat. Well, dead fish, too many to count, are causing anger and angst in southwestern Nova Scotia. That's because local fishermen know exactly what led to the mass die-off of the river fish known as Gaspero, and they've been calling for a fix to the problem for years. Our Kayla Hounsel shows us exactly what's going on. It's not a pretty sight, but it is pretty concerning for local fishers. Troy Doucette is taking me to the site of the massive fish kill on the Tusket River. And you can smell it. And you can smell it's obvious. Doucette estimates there are 100,000 fish dead in this pond. When I seen the fish, I was shocked. It was unbelievable, really. It's just downriver from Nova Scotia Power's hydroelectric dam. The utility is required to create a way for the fish to get beyond the dam. A fish ladder like this one does the trick, but the one near the dead Gaspero is meant for salmon. Doucette says the Gaspero had to look for another way upstream. They got over a bank and into this pond during an unusually high tide. When the water receded, they were trapped. So why do we still have a fish ladder that will only pass salmon? Have you been given any explanation as to why that is? Uh, not one. DFO has been aware and uh, have been looking at that for a number of years. Fisheries and Oceans acknowledges the fish ladder is not adequate for all species, but doesn't explain why nothing has been done about it. And Nova Scotia Power and other proponents are responsible for ensuring fish passage um, at their facilities. We're required to follow uh, the requirements of our regulator uh, and so look to DFO for direction if adjustments are required. Doucette says the Gaspero fishery is small, but its value extends to the very lucrative lobster fishery, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. That's because lobster fishers are turning to Gaspero as bait at a time when there are also concerns about mackerel and herring stocks. If you get more lobster, you get more money being generated in the, in the uh, local economy. And none of these fish had a chance to spawn. I would not dare render a guess on how many juveniles, but it's a lot more than 100,000. That means the real impact of this loss might not be known for several years. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Tusket Falls, Nova Scotia. Okay, a little later in the show, the flip side of farming. Sun's out, cattle's out. It's Freedom Day for some dairy cows. We will tell you what that means exactly. But first, Rosie's here with At Issue. Andrew, tonight we're going to talk about the political response to Quebec's Bill 96. As a federal government, we need to be there to protect the fundamental rights 
of any and all Canadians, regardless of where they live in the country. Plus, how Conservative leadership contenders are positioning themselves on this issue. Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine will join me after the break. I think that uh, the vast majority of Quebecers agree with our measures and I think that it's important that Mr. Trudeau recognize that there is some work to do to uh, stop the decline of French in Quebec. As a Quebecer, as uh, a Prime Minister, I will always be there to protect the French language. It's also important uh, to protect the English-speaking minorities uh, in Quebec. And that's why, as a federal government, we need to be there to protect the fundamental rights of any and all Canadians, regardless of where they live in the country. Political reaction from Ottawa and Quebec after the province's National Assembly adopted Bill 96 earlier this week. The new law is meant to protect the French language in Quebec, but its critics worry about what it will mean for Anglophones, newcomers and Indigenous people in the province. It limits the use of English in courts and public services, including health care as well as other issues. So does the federal government have a role to play here? What does the political response tell us about what's to come? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj and Elamine abdul -Makhmoud. Good to see all of you. I know you all have a lot to say on this, but let's start with um, with Chantal, given she's uh, she lives in Quebec. What what do you make of the federal government's response um, to this, and I guess how the premier responded to them, Chantal? I'm going to start with the premier's response. The argument that the majority is for something is the exact reason why we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's not to protect majorities, it's to protect minorities. I suspect that uh, when courts started ruling about same-sex marriage, the majority of Canadians may have had second thoughts. So, so much for that argument. Uh, the federal government certainly has a place in the conversation. Whether you agree with uh, Bill 56 or not, I think most of us would like to know if it's possible to use the Charter preventively to suspend just about any right that mm -hmm. strikes the fancy of a provincial government as being, or a federal government as being in the way of the way that they see society. And third, on the argument that uh, Justin Trudeau needs to recognize that French, uh, the French language needs to be protected, I don't think that that is really in doubt, given the moves that the federal government has taken to treat the French language uh, and its needs in the Official Languages Act as different from uh, the straight bilingualism, French, English, and both are equal. Yep. Uh, Althea, your thoughts on this? There is pressure within the caucus uh, with... I mean, a lot of Liberal MPs have their seats in Montreal with Allophone and Anglophone communities. I think it's also important to note that in this federal context, there is also a provincial context that's a bit of a lesson learned here. Uh, Dominique Anglade, who's the leader of the Quebec Liberal Party, had tried to court Francophone uh, voters um, by, in fact, bringing forward amendments to Bill 96 that were deemed even uh, more extremist than what the provincial government was trying to do. And in so doing, a lot of her constituency, her base, Anglophone and Allophone uh, voter base, um, have abandoned her. And I think that is an important lesson that MPs, Quebec MPs, who represent Anglophone and Allophone communities, um, want to make sure that the government doesn't do. The other thing that has happened, I think, has changed the reason why the Liberals are taking a stronger stance on this, is that there is discussion within the Conservative Party about taking a stronger stance against Bill 21. And certainly Justin Trudeau does not want to relinquish any you know, first mover advantage to the Conservatives on this. And so I think that's why we are seeing the government take a much tougher stance than a year ago or two years ago on Bill 21. Elamy? I mean, if this is a tougher stance that the federal government has to offer, then they might as well keep it. It is sort of, It has been sort of <laughs> continuously frustrating um, at this point to watch the prime minister, a prime minister who now has a lot more latitude to say more now that he's sort of given the confidence and supply um, agreement with the NDP, um, to not use that latitude that he has. Um, I think that is a, an interesting development. But, you know, I'm reminded of Jean Chrétien speaking in 1993, talking about how we've become much more of British Columbians and Albertans and Quebecois and Ontarians when we need to become Canadians. Like, this is the kind of moment that calls for unifying rhetoric. Um, this is a prime minister who's, you know what, has had a pretty good history of being pretty good at rhetoric. 
Um, so it's very um, frustrating to see him at least not take that road, um, and let alone sort of using any kind of tougher stances that he has at his disposal um, and, and not using those. Andrew, you wrote th this week about how uh, Bill 96 is about who we are as a country. C talk a little bit about that for people who may not, you know, s care particularly about this piece of legislation and the issue. Well, I, I think Bill 21 and Bill 96 are both challenges to our conception of the country. Um, you know, the, the, it's always a question about um, how fundamental rights are going to be and whether they're going to apply across the country or not. And we're not the only country to face that challenge. So in the United States, when there were fundamental questions of rights at play with regard to discrimination against minority races, uh, um, there was arguments made that, look, this is a matter for the states, this is not a matter for the federal government to get involved in. But the opposing school of thought said, no, this goes to the fundamental question of what the American idea is all about. This is about the moral compact between us as Americans. And that argument ultimately prevailed. Uh, well, we're faced with something very similar here. There are, it's not so much Bill 96 or Bill 21 in themselves, both of which are objectionable in their different ways, in my opinion. It's the notwithstanding clause. It's the use of the notwithstanding clause to essentially, as it's been said, create a charter-free zone, at least with res regard to certain matters in Quebec. We're we prepared to say there isn't, we don't have that moral obligation to each other as Canadians across the country uh, to look out for each other, to protect each other's rights. We're just going to basically leave minorities in Quebec to fend for themselves. So it's the very least they could do to say they would join a court action against one of the bills. It was a much less solid uh, suggestion they would do so on Bill 96 than Bill 21. I think the timing is interesting on the day of the Tory uh, election or leadership debate. As an, as an Quebec election looms as well, we should remind people about that too. Chantal, go ahead. Yes, well, let's take the focus away from Quebec. The issue isn't a Bill 96 or Bill 21. It is whether the notwithstanding clause, because if you believe it can be used preventively in Quebec, for those two. It can also be used in the same way for a bunch of other rights in any other province. One. Two, That's right. uh, the prime minister cannot unilaterally say you can't do this. The, the question has to be put to the Supreme Court uh, and there is no guarantee that the answer will please people like uh, Andrew uh, and, and others who worry about this clause. They, the courts may well say this is something for politicians to debate yeah. and to take it out of the Constitution, you need widespread constitutional agreement. As for Justin Trudeau's so-called means to do more, there is something called the disallowance power in the Constitution. There is no consensus that it could be used and all it would lead to, frankly, from where I sit, is a major court battle between the federal government and the Quebec government, and I am not certain that the federal government would win that one. Uh, 15 seconds to you, Althea and Elamine. Really just 15, though. Uh, disallowance is not going to be used. Chantal is absolutely right. The risk is that the federal government gets an answer it doesn't want, actually, at the Supreme Court, and it makes the problem worse. But also, I think the context is important to remember. François Legault, the Premier of Quebec, wants a fight on the, these issues yes, with right. Ottawa, as do the Bleu Québécois and the Liberals and other federal parties, frankly, have been cautious not to, you know, inflame the situation further by by battling with him. Um, so I think that's an important context to remember that even they may not like it, but their actions have consequences in Quebec. Let me quickly to you. But there are, I think, bigger consequences to our identity as a nation when you don't pr provide, when you don't get into that fight, when you don't get into that fight and say, you know what, these are these are rights that are worth talking about. These are rights that are worth protecting in this particular instance, while we haven't figured out, you know, what's what what the courts are going to do. I think just a stronger articulation of where the nation should be, I think that would be welcome, even if we don't take it to the courts just yet. It just, I'll, I'll yeah, just well, end. Identity, yeah. uh, yes. identity cannot be defined uh, by downtown Toronto, sorry. Okay, <laughs> we gotta take a quick break. We're gonna pick up our conversation in the next round with a look at how these laws are, as we mentioned, they're playing out in the conservative leadership race. I am against Bill 21. I will always be against it. We'll talk about some of the exchanges from last night's French language debate. That's next. Nice. He did not say that he would participate in a challenge to Bill 21 before the courts. I see that the federal government has announced that it would challenge the legislation. I would not overturn the federal government's decision to challenge the bill. 
Just one of the more heated exchanges between Pierre Poiliev and Charles Charest during the French language debate. All leadership hopefuls were there for the last time on Wednesday. What were the political takeaways? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Helamine back for another round. Andrew, I'll start with you. I, you can pick up on Bill 21 there because I think that's that's interesting as, as Poiliev sort of clarified or stated a new position. Althea wrote about that today. Um, but, but what did you make of it? Uh, first of all, there was only two or at most three candidates who really should have been on that, on that stage based on the quality of their French or the existence of it. Uh, <laughs> secondly, I thought it, Mr. Poiliev may, must be very confident winning on the first ballot because he sure doesn't seem to be going for uh, second or third choices of the other yeah. candidates. He, yeah. Either that or he just can't help himself and his just default mode is to attack at every opportunity. He was certainly under attack from the other candidates, but when you're the front runner, usually you try to rise above that fray. Uh, but thirdly, yes, uh, the whole party, uh, judging by some of the leadership candidates anyway, seems to be moving a little bit on Bill 21. The, the prevailing uh, message from the leadership under O'Toole was, well, this is just something for Quebec. We really can't say very much about it. Uh, and now even uh, even Poyevre is saying, I wouldn't reverse the liberal decision to to uh, to take it to the courts or intervene in the courts. Yeah. So uh, that's progress, I guess. Uh, Althea. <laughs> it is progress because up until now, the, <laughs> the Poyevre position was that he wasn't going to do anything. In fact, uh, his sole Quebec um, supporter at MP supporting him um, was boasting that Mr. Poitiev was the only candidate who would right. do nothing. Um, so it is, a, you know, the Liberals gave him a gift. I don't think they intended to give him a gift, but they gave him a gift uh, by giving him an out to uh, massage his position on that. Um, I agree with what Andrew said. I think the one thing that is really striking from having watched these three debates now between all the leadership camps is no matter what happens on September 10th, there is no way um, there will not be collateral damage after this leadership race. Like the progressive conservative wing of the party, the Brown, the Charest, even the Scott Aitchison's, I don't know how they think that they might have a role to play in a party that is led by Pierre Poiliev. And the reverse is true. It, it is really going to be a challenge to keep that party together. Elamine? I think that was the thing that was noticeable um, in that debate, particularly when we saw uh, Mr. Charest and Mr. Brown kind of come closer together, kind of come closer together in a in a much more meaningful and unified sense. And maybe the story for them is um, sort of keeping the Poliev brand of conservatism out of power. Um, but uh, the, the long term consequences for this is what kind of party do you end up with? And will you be able to keep the factions that you, you know, um, you're not criticizing at this point. You're kind of insulting. Like those, that, those were sort of the tones um, of, of this debate. So okay. it's getting more and more fractious. And you know, the conservative, the, the party did say that they reserve the right to have another debate in August. Um, I'm not sure what kind of shape we'll be in by the time we get there. <laughs> Chantel. Yeah, well, for uh, about a decade, the Conservative Party did really well provincially in a variety of provinces, and the federal conservatives feuded with each other uh, under two roofs. So the notion that the conservative movement will become Trumpian, I don't totally buy, especially since uh, success seems to come to the Ford types who went the centrist route or the middle of the road route, and Jason Kenney's uh, epic fall from grace. Yeah. But I think parties will have to think long and hard about the way that they elect their leaders uh, and the fact that they are all uh, captive to special interest groups who decide to use them as vehicles through the leadership process. Uh, 20 seconds to you, Andrew, to wrap it up. Uh, special interest groups and instant members and extremists who are motivated by only one issue. Uh, basically, they're, they're, each time they do this, they throw their party open for what the UK they call entryism, where the party is taken over by people who have really nothing to do with the party. And they keep doing it over and over again with, with repeated disastrous results. OK, we'll leave it there. Thank you all. Good to see you this week. Appreciate it. And I'll send things back to Andrew in Toronto. Thanks very much, Rosie. Summer is upon us, but some Canadians are seeing their travel plans upended. I guess we're just going to have donairs instead of jig dinner. The struggle to rent a car and the new companies offering an alternative solution. Next. Welcome back. The Prime Minister visited an emergency reception centre today in Ottawa for families affected by the weekend's deadly storm. Yeah, so how, how, are you, uh, how are you dealing with that? Justin Trudeau also crossed into Quebec to visit a grocery store and meet with more families. 
Another victim was confirmed dead today as a result of a fallen tree caused by the storm. That raises the death toll to 11. Thousands of homes still without power in Ontario and Quebec. Well, with summer approaching and fewer COVID concerns, more Canadians are trying to get away. Operative word being trying. The issue isn't just those airport backlogs. In parts of Canada, it's about securing a rental car. And if you do get one, chances are you're paying a lot more. Alison Northcott shows us why. This Montreal car rental company survived a big drop in demand when the pandemic first hit. Now they're just trying to keep up. In the previous years, it was more uh, almost on autopilot. You know, it's the regular tourist season, but now it's like a frenzy. That frenzy is happening across the rental car industry. With many pandemic restrictions now lifted, Canadians are eager to travel. But the supply of cars to rent doesn't meet the demand, and that's pushing prices up too. The main contributing factor is, is uh, new vehicle production hasn't yet ramped up to uh, pre-pandemic levels. It's a problem because rental companies sold off part of their fleets when the pandemic hit as the rental market sank and buying used cars was in demand. We would have liked to have brought our fleets right back up to where demand required when, when things started to reopen in Canada last year, but the manufacturers have had uh, ongoing challenges with production. Originally, we were trying to book our honeymoon in Newfoundland. That's where my partner's family is from. The shortage has had an impact on some people planning trips to Newfoundland and Labrador this summer. Taylor Raggers cancelled her honeymoon there because she couldn't find a rental car. We're just going to do a road trip to Nova Scotia. Um, it's a little closer. There's no 15-hour ferry ride to get to where we need to be. <laughs> um, and I guess we're just going to have donairs instead of Jig's dinner. We're welcoming everybody. Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Andrew Fury has been promoting what's known as a come-home year. So people from the province now living elsewhere are competing with other tourists for a limited number of rental cars. Turo, way better than a rental car. For the car sharing company Turo, like Airbnb for vehicles, the timing couldn't be better to expand in Atlantic Canada. The company was even approached by Newfoundland and Labrador's Tourism Industry Association as it sought solutions. When we saw the uh, the severity of the car rental crunch, um, we, we kind of accelerated these plans and our tour hosts are stepping in to fill the void left by traditional car rental companies. We're expecting a pretty crazy summer. And it could last beyond that. So rental car operators say if you're planning a trip, book your car early. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, it's celebration day for some PEI dairy farmers and their cows. This is uh, the most wonderful time of the year, as there should be a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the celebration has a name. It's Freedom Day. We'll tell you all about it in a moment next. Well, this scene uh, doesn't seem out of the ordinary, right? Cows grazing outdoors. But for a group of PEI dairy cows, Freedom Day is the happiest day of the year. It's the first day their cows finally get to roam outside after spending a long winter indoors. We all know what that feels like, right? So that first day in the sun is our moment. This is uh, the most wonderful time of the year. It's a uh, freedom day for uh, me and all the eight hours of, of labor it takes to feed and, and care for cows every day to uh, they just go outside and uh, fend for themselves and uh, it's great. We're a dairy farm. The cows have been inside all winter and um, we're opening up the door and we're going to let them out onto this beautiful grass. I get the freshest salad bar in Prince Edward Islands. They did great. They were excited. A couple of them slipped and fell because they're a little bit too, uh, too rambunctious but uh, they got up and out the door and everybody's happy. The winters here are long and cold and uh, icy and the cows uh, for their own safety don't get to go outside because they could slip on the ice and when they finally do get to go outside and there's enough grass to feed them it's uh, everybody's excited. Come in, come in, come in, come! It's an enjoyable day, it's fun. There should be a song about it. <laughs> There should be. Reminds me of my kids on the last day of school. Uh, I, you know, I was surprised to find out that apparently uh, for a lot of the cows, they can actually be nervous about going outside because it's so different, right? And, and remember, they are herd animals, so they have more of a, a prey mindset than a predator mindset. But Randall the farmer t uh, does tell us that 
In the end, it actually doesn't take a whole lot to get a cow excited. That's The National for this May 26th. Have a great night.